Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar program, and this is uh, about the tenth in a, in uh, in as many weeks, I think. So, really pleased to have you with us. Um, I have to tell you, we're Australia wide once again. We have people from WA, Queensland, South Australia, and of course New South Wales. So, I'm really pleased the the amount of attention that uh, has been generated by your by your presence, John. Uh, as usual, what we do here is we will record the webinar, people will get a copy of that webinar, and then we will forward it to you uh, once it's been edited. So please give us a few days to do that. What I'd like to do is introduce David DeLima, and David, of course, uh, sorry, Professor John Whitehall, of course, is our speaker, and uh, John's going to talk to us about a number of issues to do with uh, gender dysphoria and, of course, that dreaded conversion therapy legislation that which we'll come to. Uh, your host tonight, of course, is myself as the State Director for New South Wales ACT and David DeLima, who supports um, the South Australian Northern Territory uh, uh, members and, of course, supporters. David, could I hand over to you for a quick uh, comment and an opening prayer? Thank you. Well, thanks, Greg, and welcome everyone to our webinar. It's wonderful that we've got Professor John Whitehall with us, who is such an expert on gender issues. More than that, he's been prepared to speak up and uh, to defend the truth, which we greatly need in this very confused world. So let's commit the evening to prayer now in the name of Jesus. Our Father, we thank you that you have created humanity, male and female, you created them. And you have a plan and purpose for human sexuality. And Lord, we commit to you this confused world where we have turned away from basic biology. We've turned away from the Lordship of Christ and from the Judeo-Christian revelation. And so, Lord, we recognize there is much suffering and confusion that's going on. And we do want to pray for anyone who is struggling, for everyone who is struggling with sexuality issues right across the world now. And we thank you that you are a God who is able to restore and to bring people into a right order. We thank you that though creation is groaning, yet through Christ, this wonderful plan of redemption is enabling restoration. And we pray for Family Voice Australia as we host these webinars and for Professor Whitehall as he supplies us with vitally needed evidence that we can commend both to government and society. Mm and that in the name of Christ, we can speak the truth in order to deliver people from error and help them to embrace that which is good and right and anchored in creation. And so, Lord, we commit to you tonight and ask that your blessing will be upon it. Bless all of our participants as they listen to the wisdom that is shared. And as you bring questions to their mind, help them to be bold to ask those questions, to send them in so that we can air them with Professor Whitehall, and we can have a fantastic time of learning and discussion tonight. So we commit this evening to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. Uh, just before I hand over to uh, Professor Whitehall, uh, once again, welcome everybody. It is a national program, and we're delighted to have you with us. John, I'm going to hand over to you in a minute, but I must say that um, I came across uh, your presentation when I was at Parliament House, as you would recall. There was a gender dysphoria seminar, New South Wales Parliament House, and you were uh, one of the speakers. And I was absolutely astounded by the information that you passed on in particular to do with the Queensland legislation in terms of gender dysphoria and of course, uh, conversion therapy of late. John, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, our members are very keen to hear your views on how both gender dysphoria and conversion therapy has impacted our lives as Christians. Over to you, John. Well, well, thank you, Greg and everyone. Could you do me a favor, Greg, and show me a human being? Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go, I'm just gonna do it. It was now. a picture of myself. It's not all that uplifting. Actually. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, this is a complex subject. And I'll start with the, is this, I'll start with the thing that you have to get it right in your head or you'll never get it, you'll never understand. And that's the issue of the words conversion therapy. 
Now, we in Christianity, we have an entirely, we have a particular, a particular interpretation of the words. And in relation to the gender dysphoria, they also have a particular, uh, a particular interpretation mm -hmm. and a lot of confusion here. I think, I actually think it's, they want to confuse quite frankly. So the history of conversion therapy may be said to go back a uh, hundred years or whatever, uh, when people thought that they could convert a homosexual person to heterosexuality uh, by means of aversion therapy. That is to say, you do something painful or unpleasant uh, when you're raising the concept of homosexuality and gradually uh, you uh, you persuade the person against it. A bit like Pavlov's dogs, only different. Uh, Pavlov was nice to his dogs. Here, they were not nice to the people. Now, often the people didn't really want to do that in the first place, so it is co coercive. It's interesting that they moved from unpleasantness to electro convulsive therapy, not the proper ECT stuff, but just giving a shock. They also used uh, hormones. And I'm led to believe that they also castrated people uh, in order to set them straight uh, with their, with their uh, heterosexuality. It is interesting at this stage, it's ironical that the only people who are talking about giving the hormones and in fact castrating are those people who want to align a child with his new her or her new gender but that's moving sideways a bit let's get back to it conversion therapy got a very bad name uh, because uh, this is what it did in the past now this has not happened in australia in living memory when i was in uh, in in Queensland, and we were discussing this in front of the Parliament. The parliamentarians, not not uh, not not unfairly, said, "Well, is it happening now?" And and well, um, well, no, no, it was a very nasty thing. But now, is it happening now? Well, you know, it used to be really. Is it happening now? And then one guy, in frustration, said, "You mean you want us to pass laws that will put people into jail for 18 months for something which is not happening?" So that kind of conversion therapy uh, is is not happening. Now, uh, after that, there is the issue of counselling and psychiatric counselling, psychotherapy, um, and what the people who are favouring the transgendering issues, for example, are saying. Well, that if you sit down and discuss your uh, sexuality problems in with your pastor in the privacy of his office uh, that's the same as being stretched on the rack and having electric shocks put to your genitals before they're cut off but they're they use the drawing this one word over everything and therefore saying that this doesn't work now that's another issue, whether it works or not. They say it doesn't work, but a guy named Ed Sparius in Victoria has just done a survey and put it out there on the web. Has anybody been helped by psychotherapy and counselling? Has anyone been able to remove unwanted sexual preoccupations? And he's got something like 65 replies already. So the blanket statement that your sexual problems or your sexual obsessions, your sexual preoccupations, your sexual temptations are, are immutable and, and that's the way it is and you just, you just you give in and live with it. Uh, that is not true. I mean, theologically, it's not true either. It's, 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 a, it's a negation of both Old and New Testament. But anyway, this is what they're saying. That's the concept with conversion therapy. It doesn't work. Sexual predilections are immutable, fi uh, unchangeable, fixed. Nothing you can do. And if you try and mess with it, 
you just make the person worse. That's what they're arguing. So they've got a very strong minority, I do believe, a minority in the parliaments, uh, but they're very, very uh, tough. They're very, very committed. And I think that most people in the parliament simply don't understand, especially as far as the transgender business is concerned. They simply don't understand or don't want to understand. And these people fight like, uh, like scalded cats, scratch and yell and whine and, and, and everything's painful. So deals are done. All right, okay, well, we're not going to fight with you over this business um, as long as you back me with my other thing. And that's the way it's been explained to me that these laws get passed, like the ones that were passed in Queensland, 18 months in jail uh, for practicing conversion therapy, and uh, the ones in the ACT, the worst of all, even though it's only 12 months in jail, uh, anyone who has anything to do with a child, now I'm moving now from homosexuality in the broad sense, and I'm just focusing on, on, on children. Now, the laws in the ACT are draconian, there's no other word. We're expecting laws to be passed in um, South Australia and also in, in Victoria. So that's the problem. And now we're faced with serious legislature up and down the country that would ban so-called conversion therapy, um, even though that would mean simple counseling in the pastor's room, or if not a Christian, uh, counseling anywhere like it's talking through your problems uh, because you want to be relieved of an unwanted mental preoccupation including sexuality but not limited to sexuality this is why people go to psychologists they have trouble and 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 they, they want it to be relieved so the, the laws then have taken a very strong place against that now let's move on to the children. Um, this is kind of moving over another chapter now. We're looking at children for those who are not involved with this. I'll start from the beginning. Um, I have been a pediatrician for over half a century. And in the old days, I mean, I never saw this. Um, it's a phenomenon since say 2010, more or less, the last uh, 10 or 15 years at the most, it's a phenomenon. Um, I was in the western suburbs of Sydney, a very, very busy, ordinary practice. People would bring their children with all sorts of problems, uh, some of them sexual, some of them explicitly sexual, some of them embarrassingly sexual, and uh, people would uh, talk about this. Nobody in, in my years ever raised the issue that Johnny thinks he's a girl, never. They might have said that Johnny is playing with himself or he's masturbating or he's fiddling with a dog or he's doing all this embarrassing stuff or whatever. People never had any difficulty expressing um, these embarrassing things. And, and I can't imagine that they would have, would have refrained from talking about it. So when I first heard about this childhood gender dysphoria business and what they were intending to do about it in Victoria, uh, that is to say with hormones and other things. I was at a conference, uh, actually a physician's conference, and it was in Cairns, and I couldn't believe my ears. So I, uh, and I just happened upon this session by accident, quite frankly, and I sat at the back and I thought, okay, this has gone mad, I can't believe this. Um, I came home and was troubled by it, and I rang up some of my mates, 28 of them, and um, and I said, well, what do you think? We don't believe this. I said, have you ever seen anybody? And they put together um, 28 people, a cumulative medical experience of something like 931 years, and they could remember only, say, 10. Now, eight of those um, they remembered because of other things, the associated mental problems, um, and things like that. And two of them had been grossly abused sexually. In those days, if someone was, we were trained, if someone said we're of the, of the opposite sex, well, you would start to smell a rat. And, and there were two rats there and the others uh, were, were associated with mental disease. But uh, so that's uh, about 10. 
over 931 years, that's one every, say, 100 years almost. Now we're getting hundreds every year to particular centres, which is probably means, even though they're a bit crazy with the figures, over a thousand a year throughout Australia. And this has all taken off in recent times. It's interesting, you know, when I spoke with these people, um, to a man and a woman, they said, well, we don't believe in it, but don't mention me. One fellow who had a sense of humor, but I don't think he was entirely joking, and he had a biblical background, and he said, don't mention me, or I'll have to deny you thrice. So there are two things there. Nobody really wants to take them on. And now there are hundreds when there were one every hundred years. So what's happened? How can you explain this? Well, I, my explanation is that advertising works and teaching works. And if you go to the school and you say to them, well, you're not really boys and girls, you know, everyone can be somewhere in between. Well, we shouldn't be surprised if Johnny comes home and thinks he's somewhere in between. The education departments, through their uh, so-called safe schools program, have been teaching this uh, with as much fervor, I imagine, as two and two makes four. So it's not surprising that it is increasing in numbers, even from the schools. Then there's the web. Um, there are all kinds of uh, dark websites where the kids go um, and the whole issue is fanned by a sympathetic media on the whole. Now, not, all, not completely, but often you see these programs about the wonderful happiness of the transgendered person or the transgender child or whatever. So I think this is myself, I think this is a social problem. It's a political problem now. Um, it's a psychological problem. Um, and I think it's fanned by an uncritical media. And I think it is given direction by uh, the websites and even in the schools. Such that it's, it's kind of amusing, even though it's not. When the children start, they have the same scripted story. Like uh, I, I shower in the dark because I don't like the look of my uh, private parts. I don't like full length mirrors. I'm born in the wrong body. Um, you know, the, it's just these sayings coming up, these scripted sayings come, coming up, coming up. Anyway, it's really taken off and now it has become a socio-political problem because it's backed by the law. And for example, backed in particular by the ACT law, we'll come to that. Okay, so let's, what do people say? And you've probably heard this. And it is everybody of any reputation has been saying that the large majority of these children, um, if you basically, if you don't mess them up, are going to reorientate with the gender associated with their chromosomes through puberty. So they're confused, they think it's a girl, um, but it's actually a boy, his chromosomes are a boy. He, he, he gets confused, wanders through puberty in a state of unhappiness, um, and, but coming out the other end, um, identifies with his natural gender. Now there are reasons a person would do that, apart from gaining a bit of wisdom along the way, there are physiological reasons for it. It has to do with hormones and things that uh, make the birds sing and make the flowers come out and uh, cause people to fall in love and all those sorts of things. There is a physiological basis to, to growing out of this confusion through puberty. So most people are going to get, grow out of it. Um, and, uh, but who, who is particularly affected? Well, it's, you, you don't have to, it's not, you don't get a medal for thinking that the children who are already vulnerable psychologically, that is depression and anxiety, even autism in 22% of some people's uh, studies, 
um, these kinds of uh, vulnerabilities, established comorbidities, um, they're there in up to 70% of these kids. So these are vulnerable children uh, looking to the web. And in most of the things, the family is dis dis destroyed. There's, there's family issues as well. So in the midst of all this unhappiness and misery and sadness, and that's part of the sad things of our day and age, in my argument, a new symptom is caught, and that's the symptom of gender dysphoria. Now, my proponents would say, ah, no, things are new now. And uh, this is kind of, they don't use this word, but it's kind of like a repressed memory coming up. The child would have always had this, and that's caused, even though he hasn't recognized it, that's caused him to be depressed and anxious. Um, and um, if we can just fix up his gender dysphoria, then everything is going to be better. And he's, he's even going to be happy. They actually used the happiness words. I'm going sideways here just to tell you a story. I'm caught up with a story somewhere in Australia uh, where a girl uh, thinks she's a, a boy and uh, she threatened suicide and the police came and took her into pr protective custody and the whole thing's a great shambles. Um, and now she's looking at becoming uh, getting onto the hormones and the surgery and the whole thing. And it's interesting to me, it's absolutely fascinating that the report, um, one of the, the report is that if she goes along this way, she will find happiness. Now, that's not the first time I've seen that. I've seen that in the family courts of Australia. This child will find, become happiness. Now, I, when I first saw it, I thought, gee, it's a brave doctor that, that promises happiness to anyone. I'm going to take your appendix out and you're going to be happy. I'm going to give you this pill and you're going to be happy. We, nobody, nobody's silly enough to promise any human being happiness. But in this context, it is a recurrent frame, which gives you an idea of the utopian um, philosophy behind this the philosophy of gender uh, fluidity, that there's no such thing as a male and a female. And where unhappiness has come about is by the Christian insistence on such binary separation. The, the Christian in, insistence on a, a certain curbing of sexual, sexual interests. And if we could just let everybody be as they are and we choose whether they're a male today or a female tomorrow, and, unlimited sexual behavior along the way. Well, this is the kingdom to come. This is the utopian vision. This is them in a way saying yes to the three temptations that Jesus said no to. This, this, you have to see the spiritual side of this to understand the conviction that these people have, promising happiness. Anyway, um, I would say what the child needs, and other people have said this, everyone said, you've got this very disturbed child, you need to institute a, a program of counselling to try and work out what's going on in the family. Why is this so confused? And, and so forth. And if he's uh, anxious, you may well treat the anxiety of him. Classical psychiatric care, that's what I would, I would, that's what I would be thinking is the way to go. I'm not the only one. So what are the, what's the alternative? What's the so-called affirmation model? Well, they believe that, that happiness is to be gained if you grant the wish of this child. Uh, he wants to be a girl. Uh, fine. Uh, we can make him a girl. Well, they can't really, but we can make, do our best to make him look like a girl. So uh, we can, if he's early in puberty, we can give... Uh, hormone blockers that block the message from the brain to the testes or the gonads um, that block that and therefore you're neutering the child. You are maintaining a uh, prepubertal state and they argue that the longer you do that, 
And that's good because you will now let the child have more time to consider whether he's a boy or a girl and whether he wants to have children and all this sort of stuff. That is complete nonsense for several reasons. And the first one is that the blockers don't just run from your hypothalamus in here to your gonads. They run sideways as well. And they have other complex effects on the brain. Now there's a part of the brain, which is they are doing, you know, you have a nerve cell and it has legs and arms, so to speak. And, and this one has got one arm that would come down, say towards your gonads and the other arm goes sideways into the limbic system. And indeed there are messages all around, but let's just take the arm that goes through to the, um, to the limbic system. Because if we block it, the gonads aren't going to get messages and nor is the limbic system. Well, what's that matter? The limbic system is a kind of like the emotional soul. I don't mean that in the theological sense. Um, it, it's, it integrates thinking from the forebrain, emotions, memory, reward, uh, drive, uh, feeling of happiness. It integrates all these things, what you're doing at the time, and then it expresses that in what we would call executive, uh, executive action. In other words, it gives you a kind of a worldview. This is who I am, and this is what I like. This is what I want to do. And now this is my executive function. This is how I'm going to do it. Now, hang on. You are neutering that in the claim that you're going to allow the child the better to understand the great circumstances of life. Do you see the problem? That, that's one thing. The second thing is that another arm from this uh, goes to a primary center of sexualization within the midbrain. Yeah. Now, how, how do I know about that? That's a curious matter. <laughs> right. They got some rats and decided that they would fiddle with their midbrain. And lo and behold, they stimulate this area. And the rat, the prepubertal rat, mm. goes to a, an, a, um, a more mature state of sexualization. In other words, the female rat um, goes into uh, the way she would behave if she was going to be impregnated a primary sexuality. Now you're blocking that as well. Then also you are blocking the message which goes to the gonads. And everybody knows at the time of spring or whatever, when your hormones begin to flow in when you're 12, 13, 14, 15, that's the beginning of interest in the other sex. Now how it's completely biologically implausible that you can stop the centers of sexualization and expect this neutered child to work out whether he really is a boy or a girl. This is absolute biological nonsense. And yet you can't, I can't, I've been writing about this. I've been quoting the literature, uh, all the people's studies on rats and other animals, the children's hospitals disregard it. They just say, and I can't, cannot understand how they get away with it. Blockers are safe and entirely reversible. Blockers are safe and entirely reversible. It's, you ask, they're not. I, I don't know how they get away with this, uh, with this claim. Anyway, one other thing is just, I have, a lot of this work was done on sheep in the University of Glasgow. I've been there a couple of times talking with them. And one other recent thing that have come out with this is interesting is this, that if you block the puberty of a sheep, then that sheep um, becomes emotionally labile, more gung-ho in the men, charge at the barriers, and then they can't remember which way they were supposed to go anyway. And the female sheep were much more emotionally labile, wetting themselves, bleating, panic type run. So these are children who are already depressed and anxious and you're giving them this to try and work out whether the girls or boys and it makes the sheep psychologically worse. Even another thing in this, 
we think this through. He, they showed there in Glasgow that if you block the sheep, then they are much more likely to stick with what they know. They have a preference for the familiar as opposed to taking on something novel. Now, wait a second. How would that translate? You've got this child, he's 12, so you've neutered him. And you've, you've, you've interfered with all these various things. And you've told him, oh, yeah, we agree. You, you really are a girl. That's wonderful. You're now, uh, you're the poster girl of the school and uh, all this sort of stuff. You're on media. Everyone thinks this is terrific. And now someone says, well, or he begins to think, well, hang on, maybe am I really? When he's got it, they have shown that the sheep, and indeed, when I looked it up, I had overlooked this, rat studies, even before, showed that they prefer the familiar rather than going to the novel. So I don't know how they get away with this. Mm -hmm. Puberty, I, can't, I don't understand how they did get away with it. Okay, so the point is you block puberty, what do you do next? Well, just imagine you've blocked the puberty on this 11-year-old kid. He thinks he's a girl, right? Really wants to be a girl. He's looking at all the girls around him. And all the girls around him are, are developing bodies of girls. And he has no breasts. More Poor, miserable girl. He's not going to have breasts. Well, it used to be that you couldn't give cross-sex hormones to induce breasts until the age of 16 years. But the, um, the guidelines from the Children's Hospital of Melbourne now done away with that. There's no age limit. So now it's only fair, don't you think? He thinks he's a girl, he hasn't got breasts, everyone else is around, he's wearing a dress and he can't fill the chest. I mean, therefore, do you see? Yeah, logical it is to start the cross-sex hormones. Are there any problems with this? Well, it's all in the literature, and I'm, these are not my experiments so I'm recounting to you. Just for example, there's one by a guy named Holshoff Pol. I guess he was Polish. Let's check that up. And a few of his mates. And they gave um, estrogens, the female hormone, to adult males who were transgendering. And they did MRI studies before and in the process of it. They found that the adult male brain shrinks at a rate 10 times faster than aging after only four months treatment on estrogen. Now, we're giving these estrogens to 12, 13, 14, we, we don't know, but certainly in the time of early adolescence, right smack in the middle of a great adolescent development of brain. And there have been no studies done whatsoever. And we're arguing that we could do this and we will give them, they'll become happiness. The, what do they think? Why does that shrink? Well, they think it's due to apoptosis, which basically means cell death. Moving on, what happens to them? Uh, what happens to the children? Nobody knows. There's no prolonged study and there's no control in the study. Every other, every other study in medicine, if you want to work out whether substance X cures pneumonia, right? You give substance X to people with pneumonia and you give substance Y. You're comparing the two. There, at the very least, there are no studies on this. Secondly, they're very artificial studies because you start treating the kid and he's been lonely, he's been depressed, anxious, whatever like this. Now he's, he's the center of everyone's attention. Comes to the children's hospital, doctors all around him, nurses and social workers. It's completely un, un, unreliable. It's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's, it's just like artificial, how they can get away with causing this an experiment. I don't know. But anyway, it goes on. Most of the experiments have been, none of them have gone on for very many years. The issue is what happens when this kid gets through uh, puberty and gets to the cold 
and lonely years of adulthood. Well, we know uh, from Swedish and Belgian studies that the rate of suicide is 20 even to 30 times higher in those societies in people who are transgendering. So despite all this, they are prescribing, prophesying uh, happiness if they go ahead with it. I'm sure time's running out, and we should just mention the laws, how they got involved. I don't know. It all began in Victoria. Um, in the People's Republic down there, it began with this particular government. Um, they decided that they would bring about laws that would uh, criminalize uh, conversion therapy. Queensland got in first, um, and we went up there and that's another story, but they watered it down a little bit, but not really because they're saying that a doctor can um, treat a child in a way which is um, reasonable, um, appropriate and safe. Now hang on, to this, to this ideology of gender fluidity, it's not reasonable to obstruct it it's not appropriate to give counseling as opposed to hormones. And they would argue it's not safe because they argue, and there is no evidence for this, that if you get in the way of this, uh, then the child is going to be committing suicide or self-harm. There is no evidence for that at all. That's how the laws up there, the ACT laws, I can't believe we live in Australia, they basically said anybody, anybody who's involved with a child, that is to say a vulnerable person, who basically um, induces them to go for conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. you, know, you are trying to, you're not going with the head, you're not going ahead with turning the boy into the girl. Um, anyone who, and you sin by omission and you sin by commission. If you don't do it, that's also, that's as bad as trying to talk the child to get some, some gender sense. Anybody is at risk. So, so school teacher, pastor, counselor, parent, doctor, anybody that this is the broadest we have seen and they can go into your house. If they think that you, you're not allowed to have conversion therapy in the house. And now you see, this is the way they'd get around it. Everyone knows that teenagers can be a bit stroppy and can go and put you in. So let's say you had a teenager who was a beginner, you know, I've had teenagers, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's say you were wanting to talk a bit of uh, sexual restraint into your teenager. And hang on a second that is getting in the way, interfering with, obstructing, sexualization. You see? Mm. Now, if he wanted to get nasty, he could go and tell his, or even if he didn't want to get nasty and just talk to his mates when he'd had a drink or two too many or a bit too much marijuana or whatever, the word gets out there that Will, Johnny's parents were trying to t talk him out of having sex with everything that moved. That is getting in the road. I'm drawing a broader definition, but it is, it is okay to do that according to the English language. It goes like that. Now, of course, if, if uh, Johnny was saying he's a girl and they get in the road, well, they, the, those parents are gone, 12 months in jail. Let's say that happens and the parents decide I'm, I'm getting out of Canberra, 12 months in jail for uh, taking a child out of the jurisdiction for the purposes of practicing conversion therapy. These are laws that I just, I cannot comprehend uh, ha happening, but they've happened in Australia. Did that come in the media? No, I couldn't believe uh, that there wasn't a great fuss over this. You know, and I'm finishing up here now. Mm. ACT parliamentarian said, okay, this, this is a serious act and it challenges uh, aspects of the Human Rights Act of ACT. And, and they then put a list 
of the human rights um, clauses that would be challenged by this act. Now, for example, yes, it challenges privacy. Well, they say, well, it's so important. The child is going to be so damaged that um, the privacy of the house can be um, uh, done away with. I assume that some of the police corps can come and into your house and uh, discuss this matter with you, and you've got 12 months in jail. Um, what else? Um, uh, travel. You can't take the kid out of... Mm. out of that jurisdiction and so forth. There are about 10 of the major issues that are hormone human rights and they argue yeah, it is appropriate that these be restricted mm. because of the enormity of the crime. Mm. Full stop. Okay. Thank you, John. It uh, absolutely fascinates me that uh, we as Christians or indeed Australians have allowed this to happen. As you mentioned, the Australian Capital Territory, it is actually 24 thousand dollar fine and or 12 months imprisonment as you mentioned queensland of course is 18 months imprisonment jail the, the the fact is john that that you're a qualified pediatrician you've been around the world um i was reading some research from the usa that there's no such thing as a gay gene or see what are your comments on that, John? Because people claim they're born that way, but there's no research to quantify or verify that. Some comments on that, please, John. Okay, the, the sound is not forgotten. But the, you were asking me, do I think that people are born like this? Yeah. I don't think they are born like this. I think that uh, we would have seen this before. Uh, 931 years with my colleagues of pediatrics, we, we, we didn't see this before. Um, there is no uh, radiological or biochemical or whatever purpose that has been uh, found for this. Um, it fits by definition with a, it's not my words, a social contagion. Mm. It's, I used to use the term uh, a psychological epidemic. It, it is a behavioral thing. In, it's a, in that sense, like anorexia nervosa. We don't any biological cause for anorexia nervosa it's some kind of a psychological issue mm -hmm. and there are many other psychological issues like that yeah. well I, I think the whole thing is as i said before given direction by by the webs and all these people so i think it's a new phenomenon there i'm, I'm i can see no evidence i read this stuff all the time i mm. i can see no evidence that there is a biological basis. Thank you, John. David, do we have some questions, please? Yes, we do. And one follows immediately on that genetic issue. So Barry wants to know about Klinefelter syndrome. I understand that's where there's an extra X chromosome, uh, which boy, some boys have. And um, he, he had a Klinefelter's child when he was a teacher uh, who had some sexuality issues. He's wondering if, if that if there's any connection between Klinefelter syndrome and uh, gender dysphoria? No, I, d I don't think that there is. Uh, most of the Klinefelter children uh, still identify as male. Um, and uh, Turner syndrome is another one, which is XO. Um, no, hang on, I'm slightly confused. Yeah, and, and XO is Turner syndrome and, and they identify um, as as girls, I, I these are very rare. Um, when you've got this LGBTI business, as if intersex is something around the corner, mm -hmm. it's very very rare. And I think that they have um, dissembled. They are just smoke and mirrors when they say that 1.7 percent. I've seen that quoted. 1.7 percent of people are intersex. Now, what are they counting? They're counting Klinefelters and they're counting Turners and other things. Um, they're even counting, you know, for, for a boy to have a urethra, the urethra begins, which is the channel going from your bladder to the exterior. The urethra begins as a groove and then it closes over. So if, if it's a sad business, but it's on the whole fixable, 
the groove may not close over properly at any distance, say, from the tip. Uh, it's called hypospadias. This is not intersex. This is an issue of the formation of the groove. And they count things like that. Hypospadias is not, a, it's not, not common, but you, you certainly see it. So they extrapolated and took all those chromosomal issues in, and they took all those funny little things like hypospadias in, and came up with, say, 1.7%, as if this is a lot. Put it in perspective. Most of my medical life has been spent with, certainly with children, and, and with newborn babies. I was a neonatologist uh, for 30 years, say. Um, I've only ever seen ambiguous genitalia, I would think, no more than five times in my entire life. That is to say, when you're actually looking at the genitalia of a newborn baby and you're not sure whether this is actually a boy or a girl, most of those, in fact, are an enzyme deficiency in the adrenal gland, uh, which one way or another puts out more male-type hormones and therefore masculinizes uh, the female. But um, th this, uh, this is a, as much is as irrelevant to bring them into the argument as would be congenital abnormalities of the bowel and anorexia nervosa. Well, certainly you can get an, uh, you can get an abnormality of your bowel and it doesn't work and you, and you waste away. We all know that. But yeah. that's not the same as anorexia nervosa. So I think that they are trying to make things look much more common than they are. They're not common, they're rare. And I don't see any, any uh, biological evidence for this. All right. Now, you mentioned the uh, long-term collective experience of your 28 colleagues, but there have been huge social changes in more recent decades. So are you, are you suggesting that really it's entirely a social change that's uh, produced this phenomenon? Yeah, I think it is. Well, the word entire is a bit like the word ever or never in medicine, and you can never say never. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the vast majority of this um, is, in fact, a, it is a psychological, social, political, educational issue. Yes, I do think that. Yeah. Yeah. So I've worked you're... in other countries, you know, as well, and yeah, I haven't seen this in other countries. Mm. This is a recent phenomenon. So we are being entirely... I'm just, I'm just saying I never saw this in Africa. I never saw yeah. this problem in Africa. I go to Bangladesh regularly. I never see this problem in Bangladesh. Uh, now, there are, because of the in, in, inbreeding, in a sense, the cousins married cousins, there are more uh, congenital uh, defects there. And there are a group of people, and I was actually speaking to one, and there's a special name, I can't think of the the Bangla name for it, um, but uh, he dressed up as a girl. And uh, they said I shouldn't talk about this privacy with him, but I, we, we were talking. Uh, he spoke English, this guy, and I said, you know, um, basically, are you normal down below? And uh, no, I'm not normal down below. So I think the poor fellow was probably one of these uh, hormonal, one of these enzymatic deficiencies, uh, which was untreated. Nothing gets mm. treated in the rural area, heart disease or whatever. So that's what I'm thinking that is. Mm. So, so, so the, this the, is the, a, the, there you're referring to- This is uh, a perfect, Western thing. Yes, yes. So, so there you're referring to uh, hermaphroditism. Yes, that's which, another- which is, which is about one in a million or something. Mm. It's very, very rare. I wouldn't have seen it more than five times in my 50 years, once a decade. And my understanding is that um, a hermaphrodite who has um, perhaps male genitalia, but uh, one testy and one ovary, and, and possibly breasts as well, um, nevertheless has a very firm view as to whether he is a male or a female. I, I I think it's true. That's true, but it is so rare, and my experience mm. is so limited. Then you get I don't know. I can't comment on that. I think it is 
it's a bit like it, it, the best analogy is congenital abnormalities of the bowel and anorexia nervosa. They're not. They're not. Seen. So uh, Rachel's asking the question: Is the reason there's so much gender dysphoria in children because of education programs in schools? I th yes, I think so. I do think that we're teaching them, and teaching works. Advertising works. Oh, look, I've got a little thing here. Uh, uh, well, I had it here just. I would not. I just bought it the other day. Uh, My shadow is pink. It's a little book for children. I wasted twenty four dollars. <laughs> to use such a thing, and you say, um, yes, there are these sorts of things that are being taught by the kind of I don't know, a major authority figure in the kid's life. There's mum and dad, maybe grandpa and grandpa, then there's a school teacher, and the school teacher's saying you're not necessarily a, a girl or a boy, forget what grandma says, forget what whatever. There's, there's you can be anything you choose. I'm glad that I never had anyone saying that to me, and I had to sort it out whether I believe my school teacher at the same time. But I think that's the issue now, and I and I understand that Mark Latham, all credit to him, mm. is putting a law in that people have the right uh, to know everything that their children are being taught. I think this is a very very important thing. I would support that I, absolutely. Mm simply don't know and we we put our children there to learn writing and reading and stuff we don't want them to be confused by this yep. so a question from adam follows that up in schools high school students especially are being taught uh lies about their sexuality so how how can stu students be taught that gender is biologically assigned and that sexual activity is really a private matter between husband and wife. I, I, don't, I don't know. It's not just there. It's at university level as well. Yeah, sure. I was speaking, I don't mind saying this, at Notre Dame University a year or two back along these issues. Uh, and the, I was preceded by a very attractive young lady, an endocrinologist. And... She got up and had a big picture of the rainbow and she said, we all know now that there's no such thing as a girl and a boy and we're all somewhere in between. Well, when it, when it got to my turn, I said, well, hang on a second, we don't, I don't, we don't all know that. I don't know that. I don't believe that for one second. I don't believe that. I believe that there's a binding, you know what? But I looked around at, the, at these best and brightest uh, in a Catholic university uh, there were some very, very antagonized, bitter faces. Mm. And the person who invited me to go along and give that lecture said after, did you notice the bitterness in some of them? I said, yeah, I sure did. Mm. Uh, question from Jerome. How do we fight back and win the gender culture war? And will legal action from detransitioners against doctors see the tide turn? Well, I hope you're right on the second one. I hope you're right. Um, I think that this. I think that this is a major attack on the church. Under law, the concept that you could become a Christian and repent of your ways uh, is now going to become illegal. And the fact that the pastor could stand up and say, uh, you can be changed. Uh, th this is uh, 18 months in jail in Queensland. It, we don't, I don't think people have quite understood how this gets back to what the Bible is teaching. This, and, and we've now got laws against it. So um, how, how are we going to, the only way we can begin is to understand the gravity of the threat. And I don't think we do that yet. Hmm. So what would I do? I mean, I'm happy to come on here and I'm not, I'm not happy. I'm miserable. I, I think this is awful. I'm tired of this. Hmm. It's getting me down because everywhere I look, we're losing. Hmm. And, and I talk with Christian people and they get confused. Even in the beginning, conversion therapy, oh, that sounds good. We should conversion therapy. No, hang on. That doesn't mean <laughs> People don't know. People don't. 
no and the media or nobody cared about these laws in the act mm. this direct result is going to be on what is preached in the churches every day, every every sunday and whatever in between it's, if you if you're not allowed if you say that we're going to put you in jail if you change just as well billy graham came before you can never come again Thank you, John. And the, uh, one more final question, I think, from uh, Dr. Rob Polnitz. How can we persuade Federal Minister Greg Hunt to begin a proper national inquiry into the management of gender confusion? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> that person probably aware that I wrote a request. That request, he bounced back to the colleges and they, their strong little group just um, said, this is going to, well, they kind of went along with it. So he passed it to the states. The states passed it to the states ministers. Now it's all just sort of gone on the back. I, I don't know. It's just, I think, uh, uh, as much as the Bible is under attack, I mean, the Bible also tells us that, hang on a second, it's not necessarily dark, and I'm on your side, and, and there's a kingdom coming, and there is such a thing as truth. There's such a thing as light. Um, there's going to be a bit of persecution along the way, but ultimately, uh, ultimately, I'm on your side. I think what we do, we, I think we have to. It's a bit like the old prophets. You stand on the wall and you describe the threat as as plainly, as mathematically, as 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 you can, and then. Uh, and then we, we we commit this to kingdom work. That that's that's what I do. I even even though I'm tempted to despair, I am. I am tempted to despair. Um, but um, every time I'm tempted to despair, I I come across a my, I come across a, a verse of basics. Just listen, toughen up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we're all, well, we're all in the same boat, I think, John. Uh, look, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, Professor John Whitehall, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. Uh, you will be in our prayers and uh, we'll make sure that uh, we can get this video out to as many people as possible. But indeed, we all as Christians need to take up the, take up the good fight and uh, make sure that uh, we write to our parliamentarians. David, could you close in prayer? And I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight with us. And uh, please look out for our next webinar in two weeks when we actually have Professor John Lennox from the UK. And I'm looking forward to that. He's going to talk to us about faith and science. David, please close in prayer. Thank you. Well, Lord, it's very clear that our whole culture has been hoodwinked and that darkness is enveloping our culture and so Lord that's what we pray against we recognize this as a spiritual battle and so we come to you and ask that in the spiritual realm you would arm your saints for battle and that they would stand up on the wall as Professor John is doing so strengthen him we pray deliver him from temptation towards despondency and despair we pray for family voice as we continue to fight this battle, as we've contacted every member of parliament in the nation, urging them, because it's not just a federal issue, it's uh, an issue facing uh, our states as well, and the, and the territories, of course. And so, Lord, as those MPs have received that correspondence, quicken it to them. And as we continue to bring to them examples of terrible damage that's being done to our young people, that they would be moved, that your Holy Spirit would touch their hearts and cause them to demand an outcry. And Lord, I pray that our culture will be delivered from this darkness and that your good gift of sexuality would be received for what it is. So help us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Can I, can I just say Thank there's you. a number of questions there. Yep. Um, it, I have written about eight articles now, I think, for Quadrant. One came out, the, I mean, the most recent one is coming out next month. There's mm -hmm. one Quadrant Online this month. There's one last month, and there were five or six before. Uh, a lot of the questions that I just saw here 
uh, can be can be um, answered if you if you look back on those articles. Thank you. John, I'll refer that to them, but we will uh, try and answer the questions. John, again, thank you very much for making your time. Thank you, David, for your support. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. May God bless you and have a pleasant evening. Good night, everybody. <laughs>